folks, and welcome to the Jack the Ripper of GAA Analytics. It's the Square D. My name is Connor Galvin, your host for this evening, and we're joined as ever by the irrepressible Stephen O'Mara, the state pathologist who has just conducted two postmortems on two of the weekend's matches. Stephen, how's she cutting tonight? Not so bad. Flat out as ever with a few games of the weekend. Not helped with eating my laptop in Carlo on Saturday nights, but uh, we got there at the end anyway, just about as ever. That's half the battle. It's been an action-packed weekend in sport, not only across the Gaelic football hurling calendar. We had obviously the Six Nations rugby, we had soccer, we had the, the, the golf and Shane Lowry and the Honda. Um, I think it's nearly a weekend of analytics everywhere you look. You had the rugby talking about 27 missed tackles against the Italians, I think. St- stats and statisticians have never been more in demand, have they? Possibly not, no. And as, as we see, we like to think, or certainly I like to think, that we can break things down, as I say. Hence the name of the show. If you, you might think you're looking at a square, but maybe it's a D or vice versa, and maybe try and get at a few of the, the angles in between. Let's get down to business. First up, the, we're going north, out to Letterkenny. Um, Donegal and Galway. Yeah, so look, we'll start with we'll start with just looking at a general summary. I suppose it was to sum this game up in about 90 seconds. You know, you're ultimately saying that Donegal should have won the game. Uh if we look here, and apologies, my tweet last night, there was a glitch on my software. Uh the location that Rob Finnerty punched over Galway's nine point uh did just the point register, the expected score didn't. So Galway didn't get uh, 9.8. It was 10.8. It was a 98% point. So ultimately, all things being equal, expected score taken into, you know, the uh, amount of shots, the distance of the shots, the difficulty of the shots, the pressure. All things being equal, Donegal should have expected to have got 14.9 points and Galway 10.8. Uh, so ultimately, you know, it was, it was shot away by Donegal. Um, and you'll see there the expected score. I suppose if we look here, we'll see, just get, get a visual of that shot map. You'll see Donegal, a lot of reds in there. Um, it's a 40% conversion rate compared to Galway, uh, where it's mostly greens. And that ultimately was the summary story of the game. As I say, now, as I pointed out in the game last week, we look at these Donegal misses, you know, are they under high pressure? They, they, they can be, that shot map can be deceiving. But ultimately, when we go back to our, our general summary, we'll see that the expected score per shot for Donegal was 60%. So, Stephen, uh, just on the score expected 40. score. Yes. Just on the expected score, right, for, for those of it at home. So, anyone just joined us first. The expected score is essentially where a player shoots from and the probability that that ball is going to go over the bar, all things exactly. considered. So, we're not taking in, let's say, wind. For example, if it's blowing a hurricane and he's shooting from the 30 yards out, the odds are he's not going to get it. This is based off what? Cam conditions? He's on his weaker foot, strong foot? Yeah, really good All point. these factors come in? Uh, a good amount of them are. The system I was using last year would have taken all those factors into consideration. The one which is now more operable doesn't take wind into account, which is just because I haven't got to programming it yet, but it will. So that's a very fair a valid point. The wind isn't ne- isn't factored into this, and it should be. It's about locations and difficulty. And again, it doesn't factor in if I'm a right footer and I kick a left footed shot. It would factor in if I'm a left footer and I kick a, a shot that should have been a, you know it's on the, the the bad side for a left footer. Uh, so it's all those things um, taken into account to give you an expected. So you might say the first shot was a seventy percent, or the second one was a sixty percent, or the next one was a 97 percent, or he's right in front of goal, or you know, moderate pressure on him. So ultimately, Donegal averaged 60 percent shot expectancy per shot, but only actually shot 40 percent of them. Whereas Galway, um, sorry, but the goal included that played with the figures a little bit at the 300 percent, or but yeah, goal Donegal should have expected to have come out with six points from every 10, they got four, whereas Galway shot slightly above expected score. Uh, which which dickies it up a little bit. And the expected score, this is the Division 1 we're talking here. Now, I was at a Junior 10 hurling match there in Fairview Park yesterday. The mighty Nave Barogue were playing against St. Joey's O'Connell boys. The expected score with those fellas, um, I'd imagine, 
would be an awful lot different if you're running the stats on them or would you have a nervous breakdown? I wouldn't say that to the Joey's boys face to face, uh, personally. No. Cer- certainly not on a hurling field. No, but absolutely not. But there would be a completely different metric. And again, within my software, there would be a couple of layers of ability going from inter county division one down the way to club senior. And even though I don't always admit it, I uh, maybe one or two counties are set at a slightly higher barometer than others for club football. They kill Kenny footballers for no example. Data. I've no data. I wouldn't like to. Uh, I wouldn't like to prejudice the inquiry without data. Lovely. Okay. So clipping on, right? The expected yes. score. So in summary, okay, your Donegal should have won this match hands down. Why didn't they? Uh, as I say, ultimately because they didn't shoot well enough. Um, but I suppose if we look again um, and we look at a few more the diagrams here. We'll see. I suppose the game went more or less in in a couple of phases. It wasn't as black and white as some other games. But if we look here, you know, early on, uh, we'll see it was even enough in the first quarter. But second quarter, you see here, and again, the tick line here is the actual score, the skinny line, if you can see it. If you're on a phone, you probably won't see this. I'd recommend that's like the, the, that's like the Richter league. scale of an earthquake you have up there, is it? <laughs> that's something like that. And it was an earthquake for each side in two separate periods. Uh, but you see here, Donegal took control, uh, more or less, and shot above expected score uh, there in, in, in the second quarter. And it was more to do with what Galway did than what they did, to some extent, that, that they that Galway sort of flatlined there from 25-odd minutes to half time. And again, if we look at it half by half, you see Donegal completely flatlined on the actual score to 67 minutes. But ultimately, they should have had one, two, three, four. They should have had five points in that period. Just shot appallingly poorly. Uh, sorry, four points maybe. But what you'll see here again, what's notable is that Galway were controlling the third quarter and into the fourth quarter. But a pattern we're going to look at in a minute. Um, there was one which favoured Galway in the third quarter, which was as much to do with Duddy Gall's, what Duddy Gall did and what Galway did. And then ultimately laid on a, a pattern that you know, through the spanner of the work for Galway in the third quarter, came back to bite them. Uh, sorry, in the second quarter, a pattern came back to bite them late on. But as I say, we'll we'll look at those uh, piece by piece. Okay, so you you you've worked with both teams. In actual fact, you've worked with both Donegal and Galway um, yes. over the years, right? So on you're basically if you're sitting there with Porrick Joyce after this match or Paddy Carr, right? What are you saying? You're going in saying, listen, lads, here's why you didn't win. Bang. Straight in. Um, yeah, well, I suppose uh, one or two key points here, I suppose, to say. Um, a, a key factor of this, if we were to look at that that chart again, um, and I'll put it up for what it's worth while we're, while we're talking it through, and it's it's really notable because... Again, Galway have only got off 52% shots in this game, and that's really low in Division 1 football. Uh, it's, and we're going to look at that stat at the end. And when you break down the little detail, there's something fascinating here, and I suppose this is kind of the power of Joyce philosophy versus the previous philosophy under Kevin Walsh and whatnot. But there's a really interesting stat within the fact that Donegal have got off 65% shots, Galway have got off 52 But there's a really interesting stat, and when you look at this flat line, where Dunny Galway into a strong win, they're doing quite well, level scores, level expect scores after 18 minutes. But in the second quarter, something starts to happen. Galway, and the part of Joyce is quoted in 2019 about speaking about when I was a forward, I just wanted the ball in, didn't care what way it came in. But I think a point that's maybe lost there in the post-2002 era, after which Galway floundered for 14, 15 years, essentially, um, it was always man and man because there were no sweepers back then. And it's a horse of a different colour now. And there's some really key stats here that Galway tried to kick seven balls into a Donegal defence that was set with a sweeper. And every one of them got turned over. And in the same scenario where Donegal were set and they kept the ball through the hands. Now, when I say through the hands, there might be a safe lateral kick pass, but didn't try a killer kick pass there were 14 of them, and they scored from seven, shot wide from five, and missed 
got turned over on two. And even the two, one I felt was a blatant free late in the game. And another one, they could have popped over the bar and went for a goal. Now, what's fascinating from this point of view is, if you were to take the metric of, well, if they just didn't kick the ball into the plus one sweeper, dirty ball set defense, and they kept the sort of hands every time, that's a 50% ratio on six or seven plays. There's one actually is a hand pass rather than a kick pass, but it's a try to go over the sweepers. We say six for easy maths. You can expect, based on the pattern we've seen, they'd have scored three of those six points based on the 14 where they had that behavior. And if they were to do that, they'd be three points better off. And if that's an average, and I strongly suspect it is, and I have a lot of data on this from 18 and 19, and suffice to say, I came up with a similar figure to this in my first game of Galway in 18. They'd kicked 15 balls into a throne, in on top of a throne set defense on a horrible day in June, a January windy, rainy day in June. 15 balls, 12 got turned over. Three landed, one of those got turned over, one score, one wide. So you've got one out of 15, and then the seven where they kept the shoot of hands, they scored four. And that was the recommendation I gave, and it probably, I suppose, did come into the practice of how the game was played by Galway. It might not have been sexy, might not have been exciting, but they went from relegation favourites uh, to get into the league final unbeaten. And here I'm looking at what could have been three extra points based on patterns. And if you look at that, Drew at Mayo, add on three points there, you've won. Uh, lost the next game by a point, add on three points there, you've won. Won the last game anyway, add on three here, you've won. And maybe, and look, that that's very black and white, maybe there's more grey in the middle, but as a broad parameter, ultimately, in that second quarter, they kicked four of those away. So um, we're looking at two things, right? The quality of the ball going in, okay, yeah. is one. Number two, then, is obviously, right, the skill level of the recipient. Yeah. Galway are missing a couple of marquee forwards at the moment, right? We all know that, right? Yeah. So, you're sitting there, Porrick, Joe. You say, Porrick, ball to hands wins the game, right? Stop kicking the ball in. Or is there an argument when Comer and the lads get back all of a sudden, kick it in, the lads will do damage? How much do you read into this in terms of the championship going forward? Firstly, I think I'd rather tell the O'Connell's boys, hurlers, uh, that their expected score might be lower than everybody else in the country. <laughs> that would be the first thing I'd say. <laughs> um, and if you know double hurling like you and I know double hurling, that's a, that's a statement. Um, look, that's what I would say. Um, I think it may go against a philosophy, uh, but the mathematics are there to say that ultimately go you're kicking ball away i it looked like this in the all the final there are players there are teams who kick ball into blanket defenses or plus one defenses and make profit kerry did it in the all the final last year you've got to bear in mind it's exceptional kerry footballers you know like a shawnee o'shea kicking ball into david clifford you know these aren't your everyday gaelic footballers uh, now there is the point yeah, but I think people again don't understand. I don't want to be overstating it, and it's a point that Mark Curl did an exceptional job on him. But you've you've still got Ian Burke uh, and Matthew Tierney on that team. You know, look, you go back, say when I was involved, and the three marquee forwards, and that were left up the whole time. And uh, this is a point we're going to come on to where Comer, Shane Walsh, David Comer, Shane Walsh, and Ian Burke. What's on the field there? It's not you know, Matthew Tierney's in that league now. You know, Rob Finnerty's there, thereabouts. He's played the whole in the final, he, you know. Um, so, obviously, yeah, so yeah, Shane Walsh, Shane having Co- But even against Mayo, they put six in in the first half on top of Comer. And while the figures were better, it was still only two out of six that landed and were scored. Four were turned over. So, right, 33% as opposed to the 50% shoot of hands we've seen. But even with Comer, obviously with Comer there. But the fear is with Comer, and it's all of down, throw away a championship semi-final or quarter-final on this. They kept who for the mid Comer. And they weren't so this, so this myth, right, that Porrick Joyce has somehow kind of put the sex, the rock and roll back into Galway football is not really true. From a statistical point of view, is not true. The stats borne out here is they've the lowest shot percentage in the whole league. They have. And look, I suppose there are two points there. And yeah, I will park one and come back to it. But again, I want to make the point. And I have no problem with this. I love what Derry are doing. I love what Armagh are doing. You know, 
I'm a practical guy. I play by the numbers. But there is an illusion out there. I don't want to say who it was. A former Donegal footballer. I was chatting with a, uh, a Galway football guy yesterday on the way home. And he was telling me we were discussing this. I had my fingers done. And he said, I don't want to quite say who it was in case I misquote him. But he said that this guy described the part of Joyce era as being like having a new child. So before they're born, yeah, they're not going to eat any sugar. They're not going to be watching more than this amount of TV a day. And la, 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 la. It's a beautiful, romantic idea. And then the reality comes along. And I'm here of a podcast to put out whatever time of a baby trying to climb me, you know, crying if I don't play. And I'm like, here, the Jungle Book. You love the bare necessities. Throw it on there. There's a two-hour Roman version. Just leave it in the corner. You know, and from what I see, you know, I think there was this perception that the part of Joyce was the great attacking messiah to save Galway football from the drudgery that went before him. Drudgery that, you know, in, between 2018 and 19, Galway averaged 1.4 points per league match. Since that, in Joyce's three years, they're at 0 0.9 per league match. So this is a metric. And look, I've skin in the game. I was involved in 18-19. I'm not a neutral journalist. I want to say that. But I'm given... That's a fact. That's a piece of fact. That's not my opinion. You could many argue people would argue. Meant. Many, many people would argue. Had Stephen O'Mara been involved in the All Ireland final, Galway would be still celebrating now. <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that's that's an overstatement. And that's that, that, that you're putting you're putting two and two together, maybe getting seventeen. But um, <laughs> but there is data there to suggest that this kicking kicking was never going to work, and I suspected it was never going to work, um, and it hasn't worked. And there's an illusion maybe that it has worked. There's the data on that. But the second thing in terms of this perception, and I have no problem with this, but let's call it for what it is. There's a perception. Part of Joyce came in and Galway played man on man and had two brutal years, got relegated out of Division 1, um, having been in the final the pre two years previously, um, and whatnot. They played man on man. Now, there's a perception that this is still the attacking messiah. This is the throw-in we're looking at here. Speed on the screen, so I didn't need to leave it on that long. Straight away, the entire Galway half forward line. What are they doing? They're getting behind the ball. They're not following Dunny Galway on back. They're getting behind the ball. This is a policy decision. So that's 12 going by. You can see here, right half forward. There's not even a Dunny Galway man following them. So this is a policy. Let's get behind the ball. Now there's 12. Here comes number 13. Okay, can't see. I, th I think it's Patrick Kelly. Could be Dabber. I think it's Patrick Kelly. That's 13. Now, just in case that's not enough. Here's the most creative footballer in Galway. I probably have him as my first choice forward in any team. Ian Burke. Now it's 14 behind the ball, off the throw in as a policy. And again, the perception of the Kevin Walsh here was defensive, defensive. That era systematically got 11 back and left Comer, Walsh, and Burke up top. Like Lionel Messi for Argentina. Galway had three of them. Something which Damien Duff says can't work for Paris Saint Germain. You can have one, but not three. So, this notion that this is this beautiful, expansive game, you know, it, it's actually reverting closer and closer, but a more defensive model than what was there at the start. And it's not so just this that, game here. So, on that, right? Just can I just find it? This, I mean, this, this is 35 seconds into the game. There's one guy out of, out of the screen here in the corner, the left corner back. That's 13 behind the ball. And just again to. This is the All Ireland final last year against Kerry. Here's a kick out. Look at the numbers. Galway can go man on man here. They've actually got six v five here. You can see Patrick Kelly on the far side trying to get back, trying to get back into the screen. Um, so you 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 move it along, and you see um, Murphy's Law. Now I'm going to have to get that back up. Um, but yeah, you look along, you look along the line here. Um, they could go man on man on this kick out, but they choose not to. Uh, and you'll see if I can bear with me for five seconds here, if I can present this for you. Um, again, this is a short kick out. You're in a position to go man on man. You could. Do you choose to? Do you push forward here on the carry man? No. Everyone's got their arses to the ball here. Now we've up the field. What have we got? Double sweeper. Now, as it happens. Yes. I'd be saying to Kerry, don't kick that in, double sweep or bad stats. Kerry kicked it in, Clifford caught it, took a mark. Point. Here we are in the 27 or 28 minute. Now, what's key here, if you look at this, Kerry haven't dragged Galway men into this. 
there's a corner, a right corner forward, left corner back of the picture. Um, but bear them in mind. There's 14 Galway players behind the ball, and there's only nine Kerry men there. So we've got the number 14, which is Shane Walsh, and 13, which is Rob Finnerty. They're coming in to get more men behind the ball. Now, again, on that question, if you want to do that, fine. But this notion that this is an ultra offensive game, um, it's it doesn't it doesn't hold water. So basically, as an overall view, I mean, would it be fair to say we're not going to see a kicking team winning the All Ireland anytime kick soon, unless there's a substantial rule change? Uh, kick a team won the All Ireland last year, but again, they're a special breed. They're Kerry, you know. A kick a team won three All Ireland clubs in a row, but they're a special breed. They're Cara Finn, and even with the likes of. Mike Farraher and Gary Sykes were asked, why don't Galway play the same style as Cara Finn? They, you know, they're saying it's, it's different. It's club and it's county and it's a different kettle. So the Cara Finn were, you know, Cara Finn possibly could have held a role in the Division One National League and they're playing with their club teams. They're brilliant. You know, and as I was saying, I suppose to go on to the Duddy Gall point, maybe, you know, we look at how Duddy Gall, you know, had an awful beating against Throne, 18 or 16-8. And in the first quarter, Duddy Gall tried to kick a lot of ball. And Duddy Gall, you know, as, as one of the senior players, Duddy Gall said to me at one point, you know, most pitches in Duddy Gall are near the sea or on high ground. It's windy. We play carrying football in Duddy Gall. That's what we're good at. And I, I couldn't argue with that. When you look at that Tyrone game, Duddy Gall start, were kicking a lot of ball through the middle third. When there were extra Tyrone players around, A, they were getting turned over and B there was more athletic Tyrone middle third catching with a counter. So you're asking me if I go in as an analyst with Duddy Gall and we're saying kick more of those or kick less of those, then kick less of those. And they did on Sunday against Galway. They kicked a lot less of them. They played Duddy Gall through the hands football and it worked, notwithstanding under par shooting by guys who generally shoot par or over par, it worked for them. If I were to go with Kerry, then it's a different conversation. We have a lot of eager Mayo men hanging on the line here, dying to see their annihilation. Have we any final comments on Galway, Donegal, before we move on? No, I mean, ultimately, that's, you know, as I say, Donegal, I, I, I thought they were back. Look, the defending still wasn't great, and their figures are probably dressed up by the fact that Galway did kick those six into a, 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 a zonal defence with a plus one. Uh, still some issues, but I suppose just a table that I have here just to go on. And this is noteworthy. And there's a big, big game at Salt Hill with Monaghan coming up. And Monaghan have been an Achilles for, for Galway. But if we look, and obviously I don't look at the defensive figures, that's 50% of the equation. But just a quick one. Um, if we look at the shots, so this is a, uh, I haven't analysed uh, the games we're not doing here yet. So it's a three-game average on those four teams, four-game average. But just a, an interim shots, phases of possession through the shots so far in the National League this year. Uh, top of the league, and not coincidentally, Roscommon of 65, their joint top. Arbaugh of 64, uh, Mayo of 62. So your top two in the league are in there, your top three. So Roscommon 65, Mayo, uh, Arbaugh 64, uh, chalk these off as I go, Mayo 62, uh, Tyrone 62. Um, maybe defending has been an issue there, as we're going to see. Uh, Kerry, I'm going to say, you know, half a Kerry reserve team. 56, sorry, I've missed Monaghan 60, Kerry 56, Duddy Golf 55, Galway 49. Now, that's a concern. That's a concern. Uh, and again, maybe, just maybe, there was a bit of method in the madness of the less sexy football that, as I say, got to an ELO ranking of two in 2018. Um, maybe there was something in it. Okay. Right. Let's go on now to our great friends down west. Um, Mikhail Park, the mighty Mayo against Tyrone. Um, pretty extraordinary run they're on with McStay. They're certainly getting the uh, the clans of Mayo fans behind them again. It did 12 different scorers uh, the other night, which is pretty spectacular going by anyone's reckoning. Um, a hiding for Tyrone. Mayo's tails are up. Well, what do you see? 
Um, I see a Mayo team, uh, and I suppose, well, without you know, I'm going to go off on a, on a rubbish there about maybe a, a generation where I had the misfortune of of coming up against the, the best team in the history of the game. Um, but I like everything I've seen with Mayo, and you know, Dublin aren't what they were. Um, I still don't think the Kerry team that won the All Ireland were as good or as well set as the 2019 Kerry team, personally. Um, but they won All Ireland, you know, obviously that's what it's all about. But like Mayo's figures here are astronomical. Let's have a quick look here. You know, they've got shots off, and normally the teams getting off 64% phases with shots are, as I say, I think that's what Duddy Gall had, and it's true to hand and it's safe. Mayo are playing an off the shoulder, predominantly kicking game, and they've still got 64% phases with shots. That's outrageous. Uh, and if you look here, their expected score per 10 phases is 5.3. Also outrageous, and they've actually scored because they score four out of four, maybe four out of five goal shots. It's six point one points per ten phase. Like Tyrone's offensive figures aren't bad at all. Three point seven uh, expected score per ten phases is probably just off county averages now. That's risen over the last few years, um, but it's just outrageous, outrageous figures to get sixty four percent phases with shots and seventy nine percent expected score per shot. It's just off the chart stuff, and they're producing this week in, week out. Their defence, which I'm not going to look at tonight, looks rock solid. There's one maybe proviso that a, a Connor McKenna maybe would have unlocked it in a, in a different way because they're hunting in packs. And you could throw three lads one way and slip it back, and maybe a Shawnee O'Shea or a David Clifford or maybe Dean Burke or whoever. Um, but the, the, the general matches are amazing, and we'll see here, even in terms of that first, 20 minutes where they appeared to stumble and they were 4 1 down. When you can, if you can see the tin line there again, I'd recommend opening some of your laptop if you're watching it on the phone. But the expected score was 4 all at the point where Throne were 4 1 up. So they just, like Duddy Gall over the course of 70 minutes, they shot badly in the first uh, 16 20 minutes. But by God, did they make up for it fairly yeah, this, 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 all, this Mayo off the shoulder game, right? Take supreme fitness, okay? It does. Um, it's early in the year, right? Obviously, the S and C coaches are having a ball. Um, they're doing everything under the sun, you know, to make sure they're still in the job. Um, so if you have an off the shoulder team like Mayo this time of year who are hopping off the ground, which they seem to be, right, against a team that are somewhat maybe heavy legged, bit jaded looking, um, like Tyrone, you're going to get these results. Is this going to work for Mayo and win them in All Ireland? Um, again, look, re- re- really valid and fair point. Um, you know, they're definitely at- athletically at a point that probably. Now, listen, I think they're one of the standout athletic teams as it is. I think why they could stand with Dublin during Dublin's golden years and be there, thereabouts, albeit never got over the line. Um, sorry, but not not in All Ireland final anyway. Um, was that they were athletically as good as Dublin or fairly close anyway. Uh, so they have that again. Uh, obviously, yeah, early in the league, the, the teams who are back training earlier that are more athletic absolutely are at an advantage. And I mean, that Kerry results, like when Kerry brought it, it was still half a Kerry reserve team in the second half. And just O'Shea and Clifford coming on, Sean O'Shea and David Clifford coming on, Kerry actually won the second half. So look, no doubt about it. These are all factors. They're fitter. I wouldn't say, and we'll look at it here, uh, I suppose what, what I do here is I don't like terms like intensity and heavy legged. I don't think Throne are heavy legged. Like the modern SSE coaches are too good. Now, maybe Mayo are closer to a peak than Throne are by design. But I know from being in these meetings in inter county dealing with SSE coaches, the strength and conditioning coaches, they're not getting it wrong, or I don't think they are anyway. Uh, they don't appear to be. Um, so I, w- I don't think, I think teams look heavy legged when they're chasing shadows. And Mayo may throw and chase a lot of shadows as we're going to look at analytically here very shortly. But I don't think... Yeah, Mayo are fitter than Throne. But Mayo will be fitter than Throne in the summer. But the gap maybe won't be as far. I can't say. I'm not an SSE coach. Um, I can't say that. But as it is, and funny, it was a point I've missed on the Duddy Call game, you know. Like, I, I'm a belief in football. There's two ways of playing football. Um, I'm not really much in between. There's the Mayo style which is off the shoulder, requires huge athleticism. 
and there's a Derry style, which also actually requires you, actually Derry may be a bad example, but it's very possession-based, it's safe, and less athletic teams can play that style. And again, a point I meant to make about Duddy Gall, you know, when you go through Duddy Gall's best players, even going back the last few years, you know, Ryan McHugh, Paddy McBrearty, Michael Murphy, Hugh McFadden, Darrow Wheel, uh, Steve McMenamin, I think, lost one possession in two years. Uh, Stephen maybe not entirely in that group, what I'm going to say. But none of those boys would match any Mayo footballer, bar Aidan O'Shea, in a 30-metre sprint or a 10-metre sprint or a 50-metre sprint. And if a Donegal try and play a Mayo at that game, there's only one thing that's going to happen. And I'm of the belief that if Donegal want to play that game, for example, you can have one, max two of those lads that I've just mentioned. But they're the most talented footballers, or they're amongst the most talented footballers in Donegal. Niall O'Donnell throw them in there. Um, so I would say when you've got that talent base, why would you play a game that relies on your more athletic lads? And you could. You could pull in Andy McLean's and Ethan O'Donnell's and Aaron, Aaron Doherty. I'd probably have those three there anyway, personally. The but amazing thing at- about every single conversation that revolves around Mayo Aidan O'Shea's name comes up in every single conversation, even this one here. Right. Well, it deserves to because he's an amazing footballer, but he is an outlier in that he's the one Mayo fly- player on the field who will lose by a long way a 30-metre sprint or a 1K run to every other Mayo player. And that's the point I'm making. And Mayo play that game. I don't think, and I'm trying to make enemies in all quarters here, I don't think Mayo are technically as good a footballers as Donegal, Galway, Dublin, Kerry, Tyrone. And I might be never welcome West again for saying that, but again, it's a compliment because they're athletically brilliant. They have a style that's embedded in Mayo culture. They've a savage management team that are coaching that game plan. And I think there's one or two teams we're going to see they've tightened up on and improved on. Um, and again, the key match we're going to look at here, actually, just two, two key things on this, um, is... Two things, I suppose, where maybe Tyrone are in trouble and Mayo are doing very well. You see Tyrone here, their kickouts, right? Good few inside the 45. They're safe hands on ball. But look at how many times I've had to go into the melting pot over the 65 uh, compared with Mayo. Like, even those ones to the left of the 65, they were uncontested, more or less. So Mayo are getting their hands on the ball on the kickouts. Now, the key metric in this, and this is really, really interesting is that, as I always said, Mayo were the one outlier in Division 1 that you could give them the short kickout. And over 10 kickouts, if they score two, they probably could see two on the turnover and they wouldn't make a profit off their short kickouts. Their figures at the moment, they're thrown a problem because they were gambling on long kickouts the year they won the All-Ireland and then last year again. They've gone back to trying to get hands on ball if they can. But the problem here, looking at, at Thrones' figures in the league to date, 37 short kickouts they've won. They scored 111, but they've conceded 1 6 of the turnover. It's a 12% of a point profit or 1.2 points profit per 10 short kickouts. And this is the gold hands on ball. You want at least 2 out of 10, maybe 3 out of 10 profit. That's 3 or higher is outlandish. Mayo, from 43 short kickouts they've won, have scored 3 15, conceded 7. They've got a four, four points in 10 profit after short kick out. And that breaking down blanket defences isn't even their forte. Their forte is the off the shoulder, you know. So the metrics there are a little bit worrying for Throne. That the, when they won the All Ireland, their profit in the semi final and final, they were profiting on long kick outs, which was a bit of a gamble, but it paid off. But they were still profiting two points from every 10, which is just about okay. But the, the long ones ultimately won it, and the turnovers won. Not all Ireland for them, but they have a problem when their profit is. You know, you had a few rarities in that. I mean, I, I suppose one you had Conor McKenna in that team, hundred percent. Conor Patrick playing out with skin in actual passage in the final. I mean, you had a ball out from Noel Morgan, blasted down the mid, just blasted down the middle. Yes, feel the bike, Patrick kicked into McKenna, bang, goal. All the while, I mean, you had a very, very wasteful Mayo team. They were very flaky that day. Um. I wouldn't say they just banged them down the middle. There was a lot of work went into those kickouts. It's still a bit of a gamble, but they did pay off, but it was be- paid off based on work done. Um, the second thing is they were scoring off short kickouts. The issue that I see here for Tyrone, and 
I do think even when they won the All Ireland, this was an issue, and it was something I would have targeted an analysis with Donegal. And up until sort of freakish enough red card for Michael Murphy, Donegal were systematically pulling Tyrone apart on this in the 2021 game. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work as you see with 14 men. But if we look here, we're going to see where, and this may, this is an issue for Tyrone. And I think it's been an issue for Tyrone since I started analysing with Donegal in 21. Um, and it could, they still want it all Ireland with this issue. Um, but there's reasons we might go into it briefly. Um, but if we see here, this is the first Mayo goal. We're going to look at this forensically. And I could spend the full show on this. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. But what we'll see is those white lines illustrate basically there's a throw man to account for every Mayo man. And there's a sweeper on the 21. And there's actually, I'll call him a, a high sweeper outside the 45 in the ovals. But he's probably keeping an eye on a man out the field. Now, in 2018, the only team whose trailer, your trailer is the guy who trails the play and protects the house in case of a turnover. Uh, or he, some people call him your quarterback. Or your, but he's also your counter cover. In hockey, he's called your counter cover. Because if you lose the ball and your counter, this guy covers your, your back. But in modern football, up until last year, Mayo were the only Division One team who actually weren't bringing their counter cover trailer into the play late. And it was something like it gave Monaghan an edge until everybody caught up. Um, and it was the key tactical factor with Monaghan outplaying Kerry, ultimately that was a draw in 2018. But if we watch what happens here, watch Enda Hesham. And credit where it's due, this guy is, is, you know, he's ticking all the boxes offensive anyway. As the ball goes across, if they now match you 12 for 12 in your defence, and you've still got a sweeper, you've got a numbers problem here. You have a man less at the front of that defence. And what you've got to do is you've got to shift across. You've got to, you know, you've got to be like the guys on the foosball table, that the balls on the right side of the table were over here. As the ball shifts across, we're all in sync. And if a team aren't set up to defend that, and I haven't seen any evidence in three years that Tyrone are even aware of this concept, and uh, never mind set up to do anything about it. Uh, as the ball shifts across, we see the problem. Inside the yellow sector, there's a 2v2. But then the Hessian is coming to make a 3v2. Now, what? You've got two dead men doing, well, they're dead. They're not in valuable space on the 45 for Tyrone. You've now got a sweeper, but he's not a sweeper anymore because you're going to have to engage in the Hessian. Now, there's some lovely cross runs that are clearly off the training ground, but by the time Hessian comes up here, those two guys in ovals that might look like sweepers are not because Hessian's behind them already, and it's basically man on man. Um, and obviously, savage sidestep by Hessian. Uh, i lost a slide just to do, not to do a disservice to Hessian's beautiful sidestep. It gives it into a shame. But the point is, from a structural point of view, Tyrone have gone from a point where they had a zonal defence, they had a sweeper, there's one crossover to the far side of the field, Hessians come in late, and now it's man-on-man. -man. And they didn't defend it pretty well, man-on-man, -man, if you were to break it down technically. In they go, man-on-man, -man, Hessian beats a man, hands it to O'Shea, goal. Uh, and if you look at the third goal, it's exactly the same. Uh, Hessian comes in late. It goes from a... a, a sweeping a zonal defense with a sweeper hessian comes in the far side 3v2 hessian goes by two of them uh again probably one of them should have stepped back instead of going forward he's in the back door uh the best goal the cornerback has ever scored uh the little hollow cooper would have been proud of it but it's the same structural issue and as for the last one they're chasing the game but the communication so the, so the good news is obviously fergal logan and brian dewar they're tuned in here tonight they're looking at this going this is something they need to effect and execute if Toronto to have any chance. Like back in the day, you had Colin Kavanagh yeah. sitting on the D. He was a yes. force of nature to himself. They don't have that anymore. McGeary had the season of his life probably outplayed anywhere, you know. In, in, in. Well, a key fast we'll have a year like that again. Well, well just, to, just to give it out a little bit, I heard someone say Toronto won a lucky All Ireland. They didn't win a lucky All Ireland. They, they beat Mayo, they beat Donegal, Mayo, and Toronto. Right, <laughs> with a Donegal hat on and say, right, there was a man sent off after 25 minutes against Donegal, and there was still only a point in it with six or seven minutes left. But look, that's me with my Donegal hat on. Like, they beat Kerry by outgoing them. 
Kerry still had a really high score ratio on that game. And the key point with Mayo is under James Hoare and the Mayo sweeper stayed at home. So they didn't have to deal with that dynamic. But now you've ended Hessian isn't staying at home. I don't know how he's come to be this, the, the spare man at the back. Maybe there's somebody else, but that spare man at the back is coming forward. And that creates a dynamic for Tyrone that they didn't deal massively well with against Kerry. They just got some great scorers and got two goals, three goals in the game. Uh, two of which were brilliant. One of which was a bit lucky. Um, and they didn't deal with that dynamic against Mayo in the all the final. So it wasn't a factor. But I think, me, yeah, look, I've ever done all set up. Um, that was definitely the analysis I gave how to beat Tyrone. Bring the ball to the left, bring it back to the right, bring it back to the left. And on the third crossover, your plus one comes up. And generally speaking, he came through with a, a, as a free man un, unaccounted for. And I think it's a big, big defensive issue Tyrone have. And the more teams abandon plus ones, and the more teams recognize the weak link, the more Tyrone defensive figures are going to look very, very unpretty. Well, listen, I think we've de- certainly um, deciphered the Morse code um, from those two matches. Um, closing thoughts next week, analysing Dublin. Yeah, it's got to be fascinating. Uh, Dublin Derry is going to be huge. Um, I think Derry could actually win that. Monaghan got always a huge game. Look, that's the I'm watching the clock here. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it. We'll leave it for next week, but definitely. We look at the Dublin Derry and whatever game, but yeah, interesting times, interesting week ahead. Okay, lovely hurling. Well, listen, folks, that is all we have time for. Uh, we'll see you next week and Slon Guffo.